ayati, he was reciting the Quran on them. That's number one. Yatul alim ayati. Wa yuzakihim, and he was giving them what? Tazkiyah. Wa in kanu min qabluh, lafi dalalim mubin. And before that, the people were upon what? Clear cut? Misguidance. In another place, Allah says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي الْضَلَالِ مُبِينَ And this ayah is different to the other ayah because here it says لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Now it's the believers, all of us, not just the illiterate Arabs, but all of us. Allah blessed us by bringing to us a prophet that does two things for us. He recites the Quran unto us and he also what? And it also purifies us. Please pay attention to this point because it's very important. When Allah created the humans, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are two traits that Allah placed in the human being. And these traits, as time goes on, it is upon the person to get rid of these two evil traits. Allah says in the Quran, وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا Allah mentions two traits that the children of Adam have. What are they? Ignorance and what? Oppression. These are two evil traits that the children of Adam have deep rooted inside them. Nabiullah Muhammad came to remove those two traits from us. Those two traits together is what is called وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ ضَلَالٍ مُّبِينٍ Clear-cut misguidance is when it is very clear your ignorance is very high and your oppression is very high. Are we all together brothers? And so the Prophet wasallam, he came to remove that ignorance from you and he came to remove that what? Oppression from you, the dhulm. And the greatest form of dhulm is what? It's a shirk. As Luqman said to his son, Ya Bunaya, La tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Shirk is the greatest oppression. Now pay, pay attention with me here. How did the Prophet remove these two traits? With what? The ayah I mentioned at the beginning, it tells us how he removed it. He removed it with knowledge by teaching us the Quran and reciting it on us and the second is what Tazkiyah knowledge is to remove the ignorance so the more you read this book the more you read the Quran the more this ignorant goes the more you read the Quran the more you read the Sunnah the more this ignorant goes that's number one and the more you do Tazkiyah the more you do what? Tazkiyah. Because the ayah says, well, you him. The more you get rid of dhulm, oppression. Are we all together? And so the person has to seek knowledge and do tazkiyah to nafs, purify his nafs. And guess what he comes out with? He comes with guidance. From there comes guidance. Ibn al-Qayyim said something very profound, very beautiful. He said, now knowledge is an ocean. Knowledge is what? Baharul la sahila lahu. Knowledge is an ocean that doesn't have a shore. It's a big ocean. It has no shore. It doesn't stop anywhere. So how much of knowledge do I need? What is the basic amount that I need? Ibn al-Qayyim said, it's clear that the basic amount that is required is what brings you, what brings about certainty. Yaqeen. And what about tizkiyah then? The bare minimum that is needed for tizkiyah is what? As-sabr, patience. And then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah preceded him in this, بِالصَّبْرِ وَالْيَقِينِ تُنَالُ الْإِمَامَةَ فِي الدِّينِ With patience and certainty you reach what? Leadership. Are we all together brothers? That's what Allah said in the ayah, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا when the people come with certainty and they come with patience, what does Allah make them? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leaders. 
So why am I mentioning all of this for? What is the purpose? What is the reason for me to mention this? I am trying to say to you, Nabiullah Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, he is a blessing from the blessings Allah has given us. And if it wasn't for Allah Azza wa Jalla awwalan, and if it wasn't for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conveying this message to us, by him educating us, and by him giving us tazkiyah, we would be upon what? Clear-cut misguidance. Alayhi kadalik? Is that not the case, brothers and sisters? So this Prophet that did this for us, that because of him, we have left misguidance. Because of him, we now know the path that Allah wants for us. Because of him, we know what good is and what bad is. صح? He did convey his message. Allah says it in the Quran. وَكَذَلِكَ أُوحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ So the Prophet stood up and he, guide, he worked towards guiding you and myself. صح? He was told to what? فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ الْمُبِينَ يَعْرِفُونَ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يُنْكِرُونَهَا وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ الْكَافِرُونَ he was told to convey, and he did that. Ya ayyuhal rasoolu ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Wa illam taf'al fa ma ballagta risalatu. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. So he was told to convey, and he did that. And he conveyed the message so well, that on the day of Hajjatul Wada' he asked the companions, 120 something thousand companions who were in front of him. He said to them, have I conveyed the message of Islam to you? They responded to him and they said, yes you did, O Messenger of Allah. And then he said, Allahumma fashat, oh Allah, be my witness that I've done it. This Prophet has rights. He has haq on us. He has rights. And my topic, inshallah ta'ala, is to talk about the rights of who? The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So I'm going to mention the rights. When I finish, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to say to you, who can tell me the first, the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth, inshallah ta'ala. The first rights that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has on us and it is from his rights Alayhi Salatu Wasallam is that we love him more than ourselves we love him more than our children we love him more than our family members he is more beloved to us than what? any and everything the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون حب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين you're not a true believer until I become more beloved to you then yourself, then and your children, and everybody, all mankind, I become more beloved to you. Are we all together? The first right that the Prophet has on us is that we love him, alayhi salatu wasalam, more than any and everybody. And the love, brothers and sisters, cannot be bittamani wala bittahalli. It cannot just be mere claim, love him. The sign of loving the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is what? قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ دُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ This love, if it's real, if it's genuine, and you really love him, it has to show on your limbs. You can't say, I love him on one side, and then on the other side you're going against him. تَعْصِي الْإِلَاهَ وَأَنْتَ تَزْعُمُ حُبَّهُ هَذَا لَعَمْرُكَ فِي القياس شنيعه. لو كان حبك صادق لا طعته إن المحب لمن يحب مطيعه. How can you claim his love on one side, and on the other, on, and on the other side you go against everything which he commanded you? You fall into every prohibitions. You're careless about what he says and what he told you, but you're claiming his love. So there's a contradiction here. We're not saying that you don't love the Prophet, but we're saying that there is something not adding up here. Abu Umar radiyallahu anhu, Faruq hadi al umma. Umar, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, لَأَنْتَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا مِنْ نَفْسِي I love you more than any and everybody except myself. He said it as it was. Umar was known not to sugarcoat things. He was direct, he was straightforward. He would say what was real and what was in his heart. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, No, Umar, until I become more beloved to you than yourself. فَفَكَّرَ قَلِيلًا He thought a little bit. And then he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, al ana now, anta ahablu ilayya min kulli shay. You are more beloved to me than anything. Hatta min nafsi, even myself. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, al ana Ya Umar, al ana Ya Umar. Umar, now, your iman is what? Complete. 
That's the reality. ثَلَاثٌ مَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ وَجَدَ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ From them is what? مَنْ كَانَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا وَمَنْ أَحَبُّ وَمَنْ أَحَبَّ عَبْدًا لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَكْرَهُ أَنْ يَعُودَ إِلَى الْكُفْرِ كَمَا يَكْرَهُ أَنْ يُقْذَفَ فِي النَّارِ The, the Messenger, Allah and His Messenger is more beloved to you than what? Any and everybody. Three groups of people have tasted the sweetness of Iman. Who are they? Those who love Allah and His Messenger. You love him, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Let me mention some examples of how the Sahabas show their love to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and their love towards him alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, one day he gave a khutbah, he gave a sermon, and in there he mentioned, he said, Inna Allah khayyara abdan, Allah gave a slave a choice, bayna zahrati dunya wa ma inda Allah fakhtara ma inda Allah. Allah gave a choice to a slave between this dunya, the glitters and the glamours of this dunya, and the hereafter. And this slave, the Prophet is talking about a slave, who was given the choice between the dunya and the hereafter. And this slave chose the hereafter. And the person who was sitting in the gathering, he was listening to the Prophet speak, was Abu Bakr. And when Abu Bakr heard this statement from the Prophet's mouth, he started to cry. Abu Sa'id al Khudri, who was the narrator of the hadith, he said, Ajibna. We were, we were fascinated. We were, we were shocked. We were taken back. A slave. Allah gave him a choice between this dunya and the hereafter, and the slave chose the hereafter. What is there to be emotional about? But what did they not know? Abu Bakr spent his life, brothers. His entire life being with the Prophet والسلام, And when you spend so much time with somebody You not only know how they look and the way that they are But you even know when they speak If their words If their words is indirect You know what they're talking about You know their, the implication of their words Because you spent so much time with them and Allah mentioned in the Quran, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهُ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الثَّانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Allah affirmed in that ayah that Abu Bakr is what? That he's a Prophet's friend. There was deep brotherhood between the Prophet and who? Abu Bakr. So he understood that the person, the person that the Prophet was talking about was who? Uh, himself. In other words, the Prophet was saying to the companions, my time has come in close. I'm not going to be here anymore. I've already been given the choice to choose and I have already chosen. I've chosen to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Bakr cried. And it's, if you look at the seerah and you study it deeply, you'll always realize the love between Abu Bakr and who? Abu Bakr and the Prophet alayhi salatu Deep rooted love. The Prophet never forgot what Abu Bakr did for him. And Abu Bakr never ever held back in supporting and aiding the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. There was a time that there was a conflict between Abu Bakr and Umar. Khilaf happened between these two big mountains. Shaykhan, Abu Bakr and Umar had a conflict. Abu Darda mentions the story. When they had a conflict, Abu Bakr realized he did a mistake. It was his fault. He did something wrong to his brother Umar. فَبَادَرَ إِلَيْهِ He ran to him and he said, Forgive me, my brother. I did you wrong. Umar was a bit tough and rough and he said, No, I'm not going to forgive you. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't like the answer that he heard from Umar. So what did he do? He rushed to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He thought that if he went to the Prophet, and he spoke to the Prophet, the Prophet convinced Umar to forgive him. Allahu Akbar. Maybe the Prophet can convince him. After a little bit, so Abu Bakr made his way to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet was sitting with his companions, and as he was sitting with his companions, the Prophet saw from a very far place, the Prophet saw Abu Bakr walking. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَمَّا صَاحِبُكُمْ فَقَدْ غَامَرُ 
He's, look how they know each other very well. Abu Bakr knows when the Prophet speaks and what he's saying, and the Prophet knows Abu Bakr very well. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the Sahabas who were sitting with him, when he saw Abu Bakr walking from far, he could see his face, he can see his body language, and he says to the rest of them, Abu Bakr has been in a conflict with somebody. There was a khilaf between Abu Bakr and someone. He knows his brother very well. He knows his companion very well. So when Abu Bakr came, Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, inna qad waqa'a bayni wa bayn ibn Khattab shay'. Something happened between me and Umar. I hastened to him and I asked him, please forgive me my brother, but he refused. Can you speak to him for me? The minute that he said that the Prophet's face changed to Ali Salatu Salam, he became very angry. Very, very angry. But in this time that Abu Bakr and the Prophet are talking, Umar realized what he did. Umar realized that why did I not forgive my brother Abu Bakr? He's my companion. We've been on this path together. So he realized his mistake. So he went to the house of Abu Bakr. When he knocked on the house of Abu Bakr, his wife said, he's not here. He knew straight away where he went. So he rushed to the Prophet ﷺ. Brothers, please listen to the story. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is standing. The Prophet ﷺ is there. And from very far, Umar starts to walk. The minute the Prophet lays eyes on Umar, the Prophet's face became, he very, became very angry. When Abu Bakr saw that, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he saw the way that he, Abu Bakr was, uh, sorry, Abu Bakr saw the way that the Prophet was, his face. What did he do? Fajatha ala rukbatayhi, he fell on his knees. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, ana nabi bada'tu. A messenger of Allah, I was the one who started the conflict. I was in the wrong. It's not Umar. And it, these people, they reached that level of Iman. The Prophet didn't listen to what Abu Bakr was saying. He waited for Umar to come. When Umar came, he said to them, a lesson that Abu Darda mentioned, we never forgot for the rest of our life. And that lesson was the following. The Prophet said to them all, Abu Bakr believed in me at a time when all of you guys disbelieved in me. Abu Bakr sacrificed his wealth. He sacrificed his family. He sacrificed everything for me. Are you guys not going to leave my companion alone for me? Like or as though the rest are not companions? He only referred to Abu Bakr as what? The companion. There are lessons that you take from here. Abu Darda said from that day onwards, no one spoke back to Abu Bakr. The benefit that you take from it was the love between the Prophet and Abu Bakr. And if you look at the seerah, Abu Bakr stood by the Prophet in any and every situation. If you look at the hijrah that took place, the biggest migration that took place when the Prophet migrated from Mecca to Makkah to Medina, the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, who did he take with him? Abu Bakr. Who helped the food reach the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Who was the one that was serving the food to the Prophet? Who was bringing the food? Asma bint Abi Bakr. Who was the one that was looking out, checking if the, the non-Muslims are, are, are finding the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam? Who, were the, who, was the, who was the person looking out? Who is it? Abdullah. Yeah? Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr. These were the people. All of it was the Abu Bakr family. And we all together. And all of this is an indication of how much they love the Prophet alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam. Another example of the companion's love for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is that, as you know, the Prophet wanted to do Hajj. Or he wanted to do Umrah. He wanted to do what? Umrah. And he made his way from Medina to head towards Mecca. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Quraysh, they heard that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam is making his way to Mecca. So they made a decision to not let the Prophet enter Mecca. They said they're not going to let him. 
So they met the Prophet, they sent the first person to go and speak to the Prophet and to reach a conclusion with the Prophet. And to reach a uh, final decision with him. And it's some mufawada, some agreement. So they sent uh, Urwat ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi Urwat ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi he came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And they met each other in a place called Hudaybiyah. When Urwat ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi came, the Arabs, they had a culture, whenever they would talk to somebody, they would grab, they would touch the person's beard. Some people do that now, sah? When they're talking to you, they like to touch your beard. The Arabs, it's a, it's, a, it's a culture to touch a person's beard when you speak to them. So Urat ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, every time he spoke to the Prophet والسلام, he would touch the Prophet's beard. But on top, next to the Prophet والسلام, was a man who was wearing an armor, his face was covered, and he has a sword. Whenever Urat ibn Mas'ud's hand comes towards the Prophet's beard, this man who's standing on top of, next to the Prophet's head, right on top of the Prophet, he takes his sword, and he hits the hand of who? Um, Urwat ibn Mas'ud. So Urwa got hit a few times. And then after that, he asked the Prophet, he said, who, Ya Rasulullah, who is this person? He keeps hitting me. Now, this companion is not letting him touch the Prophet. They are willing to defend him. No one can do anything to the Prophet. They tell him, it's Abu Musa, uh, there's Mughirat ibn Shu'ba. The person that's standing there is Mughirat ibn Shu'ba. Urwat ibn Mas'ud knew Mughirat ibn Shu'ba before. They were friends. He said, Ma zilta fi ghadarik. You're still upon your deception, aren't you, Mughira? Because what Mughira did was, Mughira embraced Islam, but before he took Islam, he was drinking alcohol with a group of non-Muslims from the people of Mecca. He was drinking alcohol with them. And when they drank and they drank and they drank and they became drunk, he killed them all, he took their money and he ran away and he came to the city of Medina and he embraced Islam. So Urwat ibn Mas'ud told the Prophet, this man, do you know what he did? He killed the people, took their money and he's come to you and he took shahada. The Prophet said, Amma Islam faqad qabilnah. As for your Islam, we have accepted it from you, Mughira. Wa amma al-mal, as for the wealth that you took, return it back to its people. The wealth of the non-Muslims that you took, Return them back their money. But your Islam is accepted from you. <laughs> Urwat ibn Mas'ud, he tried to come to an agreement with the Prophet والسلام, and he couldn't. But he saw something in this gathering that took him, that shocked him. So he went back to Quraysh to inform, him, to inform them of what he saw. He went to Quraysh and he said to them, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh. Inni wafattu ala al-muluki kisra wa qaysar. You, as you know, I was your spokesman. You guys have sent me to the leaders, the Romans and the Persian leaders, on behalf of you. I have seen all of them. Wallahi ma ra'aytu malikan yu'adhimuhu qawmuhu kama yu'adhimu ashaba Muhammadin Muhammada. Wallahi, I have not seen. A people respect their leader, the way that the companions of Muhammad, they admire and they respect him. And then he now describes what he saw. He said, Wallahi ma tawadda'ab. The Prophet وسلم, did not do a wudu. Except they did what? They fought over the water that came from his body. They wanted to put their hands. Everyone wanted that water. The narration went on to say, Wa ma nakha nukhama. Hatta the Prophet didn't spit. Except that it went. Hatta waqa'a fi yadi rajulin. Fadalaka bihi wajha. Except that it fell on the palm of a man. And he wiped it on his face. He said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I'm telling you, Quraysh, these men, the last man will stand. The last man will not stand until they, 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 won't, they won't give him over, until the last man dies. They will do everything to defend him. Ubballahu, love the love that they have for him. He then, this is the love that the companions had for the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. They really loved him, alayhi salatu wasalam. And they followed him in every and anything. Hatta this love was even planted in the hearts of who? The little kids at that time. Abdurrahman ibn Awf and he said, I was in the battle of Uhud and I saw two little kids, one on my left and one on my right. 
And the both of them, they came to me and they said to me, Uncle, Uncle. So I looked at them. And they said to me, do you know this man named Abu Jahl? And then he said to them, yeah, but why? Why do you guys want to know Abu Jahl? This is the battlefield. They said the reason why we want to know Abu Jahl is because we heard that he used to insult the Prophet والسلام, and he used to harm the Prophet. And now that we're in the battle, we want to bring honor to Islam. We want to deal with him. Are we all together? So he said, I told them, there he is over there. Are we all together? The battle of Badr, not Uhud. Abu Jahl died in which battle? He died in the battle of Badr. So it was the battle of Badr. So here what happened, the two of them, they killed him and both were arguing, I did it and I did it. And he said, they made me the judge to judge between them who of, the witch, who of them did it. So the love of the Messenger وسلم, was deeply rooted in their hearts. There's even a story that Sa'id ibn Amir al-Jumahi, he's a companion. He embraced Islam later. But when the Battle of Badr took place and the Sahabas were the winners, they killed 70 of the disbelievers and they took 70 as captives. Quraysh were defeated and they, that battle was a, a, a high level of, uh, they lost a lot. And this was a big problem for them, humiliation. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to retaliate. They wanted to harm the companions and they wanted to harm the Prophet. But how did they do it? They couldn't do it face to face and they couldn't, a battle would not work for them. So what did they do? They started to hunt the companions from the outskirts of Medina and bring them to Mecca and publicly execute them. So one of the companions that they caught was a Sahabi by the name of Khabab. When they grabbed him, Sa'id ibn Amir al-Jumahi, he said that those days I was a non-Muslim. And it was in the city of Mecca. So when they caught him, they did a public, public announcement. Whoever wants, whoever wants to watch and see the public execution of the companions of the Prophet, they can come and watch it. So Sa'id ibn Amr al-Jumahi said, I was a young man, I thought to myself, why not? And so he came. He said, when I came, I saw a man who was standing there. He was not in any way, shape or form, shaken or nervous or scared. They grabbed him as a captive in Medina, the outskirts of the city, and they brought him to Mecca to execute him. He just requested for one thing and he said, can I pray two rak'at sunnah before you take my life? So they gave him the chance to pray two rak'at sunnah. When he finished, he said to them, Wallahi, if I wasn't scared, or if I didn't feel that you guys will say he wants to live for long and he's running away from death, I would have prayed a bit more longer. But I shortened it only to two prayers, or two rak'ah. But now you can take my soul, or take, deal with me if you want. So they started to cut him into pieces, the narration mentions. Every time they would cut a piece of his body off, they would say to him, would you love Nabi Muhammad to be in your place? And he would say, la wallah. For me to be hurt and to bleed the way I'm bleeding, and Nabi Muhammad to enter a thorn, a thorn in his leg, or his hand. I would never love that. Love, I would never let, let that or want that to happen to him. I would take every pain. That's the love that the companions had for what the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. So that is the first rights that the Prophet alayhi salatu alayhi salatu wasalam has on us. The second rights that the Prophet Sallallahu has is that we obey him alayhi salatu wasalam. The second rights that he has on us is what? That we obey him alayhi salatu wasalam. Every single thing that he tells us. And the obedience of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ta'ah mutlaqa. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allah says they are not true believers. حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Until they make you the judgment. And the hakam in what? 
in all their affairs. In another ayah, Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, He says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ You have no choice. After Allah and His Messenger pass a ruling in a matter, you and I have no choice. All we have to do is we have to submit and we have to follow. يَا أَيُّوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ That's all that's open for us. And the quality of the believers is what? إِنَّمَا كَانَ قَوْلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذَا دُعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَنْ يَقُولُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا That's the quality of the believers. The sign of a true believer is that when he's told Allah and his messenger said this, they don't question and nor do they argue. They listen and they obey. This is the second right that the Prophet has on us. That we obey him unrestrictedly. I want to say to my sisters, and I want to say to my brothers, you meet a sister and you say, my beloved sister, Allah Azza wa Jalla permitted this. Allah wa Ta'ala prohibited this. And there's ifs or buts. You meet a brother, same thing. You say, Akhi, my beloved brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted this and also he prohibited this. Because a lot of the times, brothers, mashallah, are very enthusiastic to talk to sisters about hijab. And they have every right to talk to them. But if the tables are turned and the brother is told, okay, what about you? Why is your garment below your ankles? And why don't you have a beard? Are we all together, brothers? Both of them are obligations, huh? are they not? The obligation, we all have to follow it, right? Do we have a choice to say, Ya Rabb? Do we have a choice to say to the Prophet, we accept this or we reject this? Are we all together, brothers? So everything that the Prophet made obligatory, we have to, we have to follow it. Everything that the Prophet prohibited that we have to consider it to be haram and stay away from it. Hey, who remembers what the first rights that the Prophet had on us was? Yeah, I want the people at the back. Yeah? What was the first right? The first rights that the Prophet had. Somebody from the back. Hey, yeah? You put your hand up. Hey, you put your hand up, huh? Yes. Ya yeah, too? To love the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he gave us one evidence of loving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even if it's paraphrasing a hadith or an ayah, no problem. So some of the stories of the companions. Any other evidences that I gave? Hayya. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhbibukum Allah. Any other evidence I gave? Ha, faddal. Ha. You don't believe until you fully be a lover of the Prophet Muhammad and you start the family and the fall of my feet. La yuminu hadikum hatta yuhibbul ahihi ma la yuminu hadikum hatta akuna habba ilayhi min walidi wa alidi wa nasib ma'in. Sah? Hey, what was the second rights that we mentioned that the Prophet has? Hey, Faddal, hey, We have to obey him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hey, you can give us one evidence that we have to obey him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Hey, yeah. You have to listen to his hadith, but what's the evidence? That's a way that we have to obey him. But any evidence from the Quran or the Sunnah that we have to obey him. The obedience of the Prophet, is it unrestricted or is it certain times we obey him and certain times we don't obey him? Yeah? Is the obedience of the Prophet unrestricted or is it certain times and certain times we don't obey him? Huh? Unrestrictedly we obey him, sah? What's the evidence that we have to obey him unrestrictedly? Hey, yeah? Hey? The ayah is an evidence which is showing that we have to obey the Prophet ﷺ. But can somebody really extract a ruling from somewhere, from the verses or hadith to show us that we have to obey him unrestrictedly? Hey? Yeah? Hey. 
That ayah, but how, how, how does that ayah show us? I, I need, ist, I need istidlal of the nas ayah, the text. Sah. The fact that Allah mentioned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and him together, Ya Yuladina Amun Ati'ullah. And he repeated the word again, what? Wa Ati'u. Wa Ati'u al It got repeated again, meaning, and him as well. Why? Because he's a revelation that we have to follow. Now, the third, inshallah ta'ala, writes that the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam has on us is we have to send salutation on him. As Salatu Wasallam. It's the rights that the Prophet has on us. Which, which number are we on? Number three. Allah says in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayyu al-ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. So we have to send salah on him and salam. Man salla alayya salatan wahida sallallahu biha sallallahu alayhi biha ashara. Anyone who sends salutation on the Prophet ﷺ, how much will be sent on you? Ten. Who here sits down and sends salutation on the Prophet ﷺ sometimes? MashaAllah, Allah. What do you say when you sit down and you send salutation on the Prophet? Allahumma barik. That's good, MashaAllah. Ayah? For example, on Fridays, a lot of people don't do this, but when you come to the Khutbatul Jum'ah on Friday, you come very early, and the Imam hasn't come yet, and the masjid is open, you sit there, and all you do from until the time the Imam comes, what can you do? Send a salutation of the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam. Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahimahullah, he mentioned in his kitab, Jalaul Afham, Fi Fadli Salati Ala Khayr Al-Anam, that this is the Amr Salaf, we all together, brothers. We mentioned three rights. The fourth right that the Prophet ﷺ has on us is that we take him as a role model. Taking him as a role model is more than just following him. ﷺ. Seeing him as a role model is that I don't need anybody else. I don't need a football player. I don't need an artist, an actor, this. I don't need all of that. The messenger is my role model. That the Prophet becomes your ultimate role model. You follow him, follow him from the heart and outside. People who say to you, brothers, if you do not have a role model, or you say to yourself, I don't have a role model, that's not the truth. How can you do how do you not have a role model when you have Nabila Muhammad alayhi salatu salam? It's sad when you see Muslims following people that they meet or they see on social media. Sah? They meet people on social media and they love these people, they admire, they follow, they too much to the extent it's become what? Ta'alluh. It's like they worship these people. Sah? Football players, right? Yeah? Football player. Was it one time uh, I saw one of these football players, he took off his shoes that he sweated and he gave it to one of the fans who was sitting on the bench in the game and the way that that fan cried and was emotional yeah? is that not tabarruk? yeah? isn't that not going overboard in, I think he's sweating it yeah? Waqashin, yeah. huh? He's given his shoes to you that he played football with, and this person is going, he did, he, did he give you money? But one brother corrected me one time and he said to me, Sheikh, Sheikh, you're, you're getting it wrong here. I said, why? He said, the shoes cost money. He said, if he gave it to me, I'll take it, I need to sell it. So, but the truth of the matter is, so, the people are like, he, he saw me, he, he looked at me. Are we all together? How can you have that and the love of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam in your heart? Sah? Wallahi, there's no one you need after the Prophet and the companions. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum. 
May Allah be pleased with the noble companions. The rights of the Prophet ﷺ also has on us is that we study his seerah. We learn his biography. It's the rights that he has on us, alayhi salatu wassalam. Are we all together, brothers? Yeah? So if I asked you guys now the Prophet's full name, you can all tell me, right? Yeah? I'm not going to put you guys on the spotlight. But I'm saying, if I wanted to, hypothetically, I wanted to ask you guys the first, the, the five names of the Prophet, Muhammad bin, huh? five names, you guys can tell me. Because a lot of you guys know how much this football player was bought for and what club bought him and what year he played for them and how many seasons was that and how many goals they scored in that season. So, you know that stuff, right? Yeah? Or my unfairly uh, accusing you guys no so if you know them that much that matafasil ma'lumat you have of them why did the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam are we all together brothers you have to know him very well walidhalika shaykh muhammad abdul wahab rahimahullah ta'ala in his kitab thalathatul usul what he did was he wrote a small biography that every single body needs to know about the Prophet, which you should not be ignorant about. So you need to know his name. At least you need to know him and his father's name. Are we all together? You need to know when he was born. You need to know when he died, how old he was, والسلام, basic information is in the book, Usul. That amount a Muslim should know about the Prophet. You can't be asked a question, the Prophet about what country was he from? And you're like, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's from Iraq. Or maybe he's from this country. Are we all together, brothers? You don't know anything about the Prophet's biography, and then you say, I love him, I'm his follower, I'm, his, I'm, his, I'm from his ummah. I have to take time out and study him. Sah? Here, let's ask some questions. If you want to answer it, you can put your hand up and answer it. Here, how old was the Prophet when he became a prophet? How old? Hey? The young ones. Hey? How old was he when he became a prophet? 40. MashaAllah. Hey, how old was he when he passed away? Hey? 63. So how, long, how long was he a prophet for? 40 and 63. So how old was he a prophet for? Hey? 23 years. Good. How many years of those 23 did he spend in Mecca? At the back, stand up. Stag, Mukumakali Kiri. 13 years he was in what? 13 years he was in Mecca. How many years was he in Medina for? And people, people here are a bit quiet. What's happening, brothers? Ah, Fadal. 10 years in where? Medina alayhi salatu wasalam. How many children did the Prophet have? Are you sure? Are you who disagrees with him? Who disagrees with him? He said seven. Who believes they're not seven? Right, what do you think? Yeah? You think six? Yeah. Who thinks more? Yeah. Thinks how, how many do you think? Three only kids. Like what were their names? You want to call a friend? Or pass on to somebody else, hey? No, I know, I know. I was joking. Hey, somebody in the back? Hey, how many children did the Prophet have? Hey? He had six kids. Huh? You sure? You're guessing. I'm, I'm doing this. I really want. You can't Google anything, brothers. The idea is to put pressure on you guys so you guys realize wow. Are you? There's a difference of opinion. Allahumma barik. 
Leicester is different. Allah very. Hey, according to who? You mean the difference between in this room? Hey, who? Who uh, in the back? Hey, well, who's the oldest child in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? These kids. Let's count it together. Hey, oldest. Who's the oldest child that the Prophet had? Yeah. Qasim. Hey, next. Silence. Brothers, this is the basic knowledge. This is what? Basic knowledge. Are we all together, brothers? Am I, am I being fair? Yeah. If you don't know, don't worry. Just go home and say, no, I'm not doing a good job in my life. Huh? There's basic books you can read, like Kitab. It's a very small book and literally it goes through the Prophet's life in a chronological order. Basically when he was born until he died, what happened every year in his life? Are we all together? Okay, who was the first carer for the Prophet ﷺ? Who first cared for him? Are you? Uh, yeah? Amina was the first person to care for him. Who was she? Yeah, so his mom, Amina, was the first person to care for him. And then who did she pass the caring on to? Hey, who was she? she what did she do? So what, what did she do for the Prophet? As a child, good. Hey, who else looked after the Prophet? Hey, Abu Talib, yeah? Who's Abdul Muttalib? Grandfather from the mother's side or the father's side? Okay, who's the next person who looked after him? Oh, who's Abu Talib? Who's Abu Talib? Who's helping you from the side? Are you sure? Hey? Yeah? Hey, what did Thuwaiba do? She breastfed the Prophet. Was she before Halim Sa'adiyah or after Halim Sa'adiyah? Yeah? She was before Halim Sa'adiyah. Suwaiba was before Halim Sa'adiyah. Hey, who agrees with Ibrahim? Yeah? Was Suwaiba first? Yeah? Hey, who thinks Suwaiba was first before Halim Sa'adiyah? Yeah? You agree? Who did Suwaiba also breastfeed? There's other people she breastfed with the Prophet. Hamza, hey, who else? Yeah? Huh? Yeah. Abu Salma. Abu Salama. The, mother, the wife of who? Umu Salama. So, him and the Prophet So what we learn from here, brothers, is Learning the Prophet's biography alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam. So if you don't know his biography, please go home, buy the book Seal of Nectar, and go through it, right? Open that book and read about the Prophet. At least have a basic understanding of who he is. Are we all together, brothers? And know his biography alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wasalam. The last and final point, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to mention is if you have any questions, ask me, inshallah. If anyone has any questions, I will try to answer what I know and what I, what I don't know. I will just say, Allahu A'lam. Ayyah. Ayyah, fadl. You have to, you want to ask a question, hey? Immediately, not but and then after, and then immediately change religion, and then you change religion again, back to Islam. And you do that. You, you wanted to change. No, I'm not. Shaka. Okay. My friend, my friend, you, when you were just having a joke, and you were still telling me, like, oh, I'm now this religion, oh, no, I'm now Muslim again. 
He was just saying it. Okay, okay. I'll ask you a question. Again, it's dangerous, right? If you school what the kids hear and the effect that other kids have on them. So it's important for me to answer your question, okay? Are you listening? Okay. A person is not allowed to leave Islam. And they have to stay as a Muslim. But if it happens, a person does leave Islam. And they ask Allah for forgiveness and they come back. Allah will accept their repentance as long as they're alive. If they die, when, if so, they left Islam and they died, Allah will punish them forever and ever. They haven't died, have they yet? So, inshallah ta'ala, Allah will accept it from them. Inshallah ta'ala. Very good question, okay? That was a very, very good question. How did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deal with the new people? A lot of people that are deluded, you know what I mean? How did he deal with them? Delusions. So those who opposed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's message were deluded in the way that they saw things, right? The disbelievers, they saw that the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam was upon falsehood and that they were upon truth. And the way that he dealt with them is different in the way that he dealt with them in Mecca compared to the way he dealt with them in Medina. In Mecca it was الْمُشْرِكِينَ Turn away from the disbelievers. يعني, don't engage, leave them, be patient. But then in Mecca and Medina, there was a different story. The Prophet Sallallahu waged war in the city of Medina. It was a different discussion. Ma'am. Fadl Habibi. Ah. Two questions. Yeah? Hey, first one, inshallah ta'ala. First, what do you mean by hak? Hak in what sense? When we say hak of the Prophet, Sah. what does the hak mean? Very good thing. And the second one is. So let me answer the first one. The word hak means rights, right? The reason this, I mentioned. I chose this uh, tour to be based on Haq was that the story of Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda. As you know, the Prophet Akha Baina Salman wa Abu Darda. The Prophet made Salman and Abu Darda be brothers. So one day Abu Darda, Salman al-Farisi came to the house of Abu Darda and he saw Ummu Darda wearing clothing that was not nice. Meaning she was wearing very simple clothes, it was ripped and all of that. So Salman al-Farisi said to Umm Darda, What's your story? What happened to you? She said, uh, Your brother Abu Darda, Your brother Abu Darda, He has no desire for the dunya. He doesn't want this dunya. Are we all together? And he has no raghba and desire for the dunya. So she said, When she said that, not long after that, Abu Darda came to the house and he asked his wife to make food for Salman al-Farisi. And when the food was put on the table, Salma, Abu Darda said to Salman, I'm not eating, I'm fasting. And Salman al-Farisi said, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat until you eat with me. You're going to have to eat the food with me. So then he broke his fast and he ate with him. At night time when they went to sleep, Salman al-Farisi got the, red, the bed ready for uh, Salman al-Farisi, uh, Abu Darda got the bed, bed ready for Salman al-Farisi and then he said sleep and he went up and stood up to pray. And he said to him, you go to sleep, you're not going to pray right now, go to sleep. So he went, he went to sleep, he woke up, he wanted to pray again, he said no, 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 go back to sleep again. So Abu Darda went and slept a little bit, then he woke up and he said let's pray together now. In the morning, Salman al-Farisi said to his brother Abu Darda something. He said, Inna li alayka, Inna li Allah has rights on you. Wali nafsika alayka haqqa. Your nafs has rights on you. Wali ahlika alayka haqqa. And your wife and your children and your family have rights on you. Fa'ati kulladi haqqin haqqa. Give everyone their rights. So I thought to myself, why don't I make a tour up and down the country in the UK where I only focus on the what? Rights. So here I'm speaking about the rights of the, the Prophet 
In Kilbin, I spoke about the rights of the, the Quran. Uh, what were the other rights I spoke about? I'm so tired now. So then I've got one on the rights of friendship. One I've got on the rights of Ramadan. And then the other one I've got rights on. Uh, I've spoken about the, the rights of the household. I also have rights of knowledge. So that's where the concept of huquq came into it. صح? Also the ayah, وَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَارِ الْجِرُوبِ وَالسَّاحِبِ بِالْجَمِ The ayah that mentions it. What's the, what's the ayah called? What's the name for, the, for that ayah? It's called Ayatul Huquq. What's it called? It's called Ayatul Huquq. Meaning it mentions all the people who have rights on you. صح? And it starts with whose rights? Allah. So that's where the idea of this concept of being haq of this and haq of that came from. Does that make sense? Uh, does that answer your question? The second one is? The second one is, what's the point of learning sirah in such detail? Like, you know, you cross the hand, gray hair, you may go back to the there. What benefit does it bring to Muslims and us? It increases your iman. The more you learn about the one you love, the more you start to want to emulate, emulate him and copy him and be like him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Are we all together, brothers? I'll tell you guys a quick story. I've only got 10 minutes left. I was reading, I, I now teach the seerah in the UAE. Okay? Uh, in Dubai, I have a masjid and I teach the Prophet seerah, alayhi salatu wasalam. So I read the kitab, Rawul Uluf, by a Suhaili. And I bring other books to read when I prepare the seerah. Who's, who's, who watches the seerah classes? Who's? When I was preparing the beginning, you might, I'm, tr I'm trying to answer your question. At the beginning when I was looking into the tribes, the Arab tribes, the Arab tribes are broken into two, right? Arab al-Ariba and Arab al-Musta'ariba. The Arabs that were Arabized and those were original Arabs, right? And the Prophet ﷺ was Arab which was? He was Arabized, right? Meaning, the Prophet ﷺ is from Ismail, and Ismail, he came to Mecca, and he wasn't an Arab. He was speaking another language. What language was he speaking? Yeah? So, a lot of historians have mentioned that he was speaking Babylon, Babylon language, صح? So, anyways, Ismail, when he came, so, so Ibrahim was speaking that language. Ismail was too young. Ismail, when he came, he grew up with the tribe of Jurhum. صح? He grew up with the tribe, tribe of what? Jurhum. That's when he learned Arabic. He married a woman from the people of Jurhum. The people of Jurhum are Arabun Akha. They're real Arabs. He married them. He had kids from them. And that's where the Prophet came from. And he had that lineage. Now, I haven't finished my point. While I was preparing this, and I was going through the Arabs and the kingdoms of the Arabs. And before Nabi Muhammad come, came, I came and I stumbled over in the Sira books, the last, one of the last kingdoms of one of the Arab tribes. Because Arab the Arabs are also divided into Arab al-Ba'ida, Arabs who have perished and Arabs who haven't perished. So I came across one of the Arab tribes, which were known as the Arabs called the Ghassasina. What are they called? al -Ghassasina. They were one of the Arabs. I want to mention a story that's very important here. Who was the last king of the kings of the people of Muluk al Does anyone know who his name is? Uh, Jabalat ibn al Ayham is the last king from the kings of what? He was the last king of the people of Ghassasina. I'm just going to quickly mention his story, and that story affected me deeply when I, I was not even, this is not part of the seerah, but it's before the seerah. Jabalat ibn al Ayham was the last king. At the time of Umar ibn al Khattab, he embraced Islam. He sent a letter to Umar and he said, Umar, I want to enter this Islam. I am the last king from the kings of the people of Ghassasina. I'm going to come. Can I embrace Islam? Umar said, of course, come. When he came, the city of Medina, there was nothing like it. It was Yawmun Mashud. The city, everybody welcomed him. They know his story. He's, from a, he's a, from, from, from a family of kingdom. They said when he came in, 
he couldn't enter Medina from one, one gate. So he, he had to circulate the city. And his people couldn't live in the city of Medina. They had to live outside of the city of Medina because of their number. Or too large in number. And he was like that. Umar radiallahu anhu that year, he made a decision that he's going to go for Hajj. Jabalat ibn al ayhan came to Umar and he said, I want to do Hajj with you. Umar said, come with me. Come do Hajj with me. So he went and done what? He went and done Hajj with Umar. While they were around the Kaaba and doing Tawaf, one man by accident, he stepped on the Ihram, a Muslim man, he by accident he stepped on the Ihram of Jabalat ibn al ayhan Jabala, his garment showed, so his aura was seen now. He picked it up, covered himself, and he slapped the man so badly that he caused the man's eye to come out. This, the Hajj carried on. The man cried. He went to, uh, the man went to Umar ibn Khattab. He said, Umar, this is what Jabal ibn Ayham did to me. Can you see my face? What you see is the action of Umar ibn uh, Jabal. So the Prophet said, he called Jabal. So Umar said, call Jabal, Jabal ibn Ayham. They went and they called Jabal ibn Ayham. They said, Jabal, did you do this? He said, I did do it. Umar said, okay, if you did do it, then we're going to do it to you. Come here. He said, Umar, Umar, I think you're forgetting, he said. I'm Jabal ibn al -Ayham. Are you really going to hit me for this man? Umar said, yeah, of course, 100%. He said, Umar, wallahi, I thought when I embraced Islam that I would be more honorable than I was before Islam. Are you telling me that I'm going to now be here? My eye is going to go because of this man. Umar said, listen. In the religion of Islam, when you entered it, you entered it with equality. You and this man are the same to me. You have two options. Either you bring your face forward, or you talk to this guy and you come to an agreement with him. Or I will do to you what you did to him. So um, Jabal looked at the man and said, okay, I'll give you something, leave me. The man said, no. I want your, what you did to me has to happen to you. Jabal said, wait, I'll give you what you want. Mention your money. You have to look like me. Umar looked at, uh, Jabala looked at Umar, he said, Umar, are you really going to do it? Umar said, Wallahi, I will. He said, okay, give me till tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, something, I'll give you something. Umar said, okay, I'll give you till tomorrow, no problem. I'll, he said, I'll reach something with this man tomorrow. Umar said, okay. Jabala ibn al-Ayham went to his people, he said, all of you guys, get up, get up, get up. We're not going to stay here anymore. Sorry, I missed a part. Umar, Jabala, before he left, he looked at Umar, he said, you really are going to hit me? Umar said, yes. He said, Wallah, I'm going to leave Islam. Umar said, Wallah, if you leave Islam, I'll cut your head off. Not just your face. I'll cut your head off. He saw seriousness and he saw jid. He packed his bags. He went to his people. He said, listen, let's go. One night, the army of Jabal ibn al ayham left the city of Medina. And because Jabal ibn al ayham was from Sham, the people they resided with, with was the Romans. Originally, they were Christians, right? the people of Assasina, he went back and he took the religion of the Christians. And he left Islam bilkulliya. He apostated. So what happened was, I'll tell you guys the end of the story next time when I come, inshallah ta'ala. Anything I've said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaytan and Allah and his messenger are both free from it. I hear two questions, one question from the sisters. How can I improve my concentration in the Salah? What to do if OCD is running in Salah and making me waste water? Two, one, two questions in one. Concentration in Salah and obsessive compulsive disorder. What's the next question? Second one? See which one I can see. Uh, when, when you make a wudu for Salah. Those are two questions. Yeah. It's a bit long, the answer to this question. So what I am going to do, inshallah ta'ala, is I'm going to make a long video on it. So I'll release a video on this topic of al-waswas. Okay? And how to separate waswas from OCD. Are they both the same thing? Is obsessive compulsive disorder and waswas the same thing? Or are they two different things? So inshallah ta'ala, I think it's a lengthy lecture that needs to be done. But in the meantime, 
do not listen to the whispers of shaitan. If you have shak, there was a time I had some shak used to come to me, especially when I drive. I used to sometimes feel like, well, did, I, did I close the car? Did I not? It started very small. So whenever I leave the car, I would press the button. And in my heart, I feel like I haven't closed the car. So I'd go and I'd check. Basic, right? We all do that, right? It got very bad. Uh, every time. And then it started to enter so many things where I started thinking, this one I have to very check, double check, double check. And that double checking became what? So the hardest thing I had to do was, I had to stop myself and say to myself, listen, whether that car is open or not, you just have to stop. Until you come to that neutral position where you can slowly consider your actions again. Does that make sense? So somebody does full wudu. I know a brother, subhanAllah. He has, I, I stood next to him. He said, I need to do wudu. Can you come check me do wudu? He has waswas. He's think, he does this hand. And he does his hand. And he goes, oh, I didn't do this hand. He goes back to it again. A very tough. His mom, he brings her bills like 300, 400 just from the hot water that he uses. So he said, Akhi, can you stand next to me and watch me if I do the wudu? So he does the wudu and he comes back to it again. I said, Akhi, I just saw you do it. I'm standing here. Four eyes are on you. My two eyes and your two eyes. He goes, no, no, no. I think you missed it as well. <laughs> well, I don't laugh, brothers. It's, not, it's, not, it's a very deep condition. I saw a situation similar to that where a brother said, Allahu Akbar for Dhuhr and I saw him at Isha. Wallahi, I'm not exaggerating. I saw him Isha still saying Allahu Akbar. He didn't pray Dhuhr. Still saying Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Well, waswas can get very bad. Some people get to that level of waswas. Huh? I know a brother, every day he's calling me and he's saying to me, I divorced my wife. Sheikh, I think I said I divorced her. I think I did. Oh, yeah, he didn't. Oh, no, Allah, Sheikh, I did. I think I said something to her. Waswas. Are we all together? So he asks me 10 questions, Sheikh, you just please answer it for me. So that's what I'm saying. It's a topic that's very deep. So to tackle all of that and all the different levels that it has, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to make a video uh, on it to be in Ilahi uh, al kareem Okay? Brothers, inshallah ta'ala, I have one last uh, lecture in Quba, inshallah ta'ala, on the Ahkam uh, al-Siyam bi al kareem So if you want, inshallah ta'ala, and you want to benefit, inshallah, come. If not, I wouldn't come as well if I was doing my own lecture. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum wa khayran.